you know how much you're willing to pay to ride. RTD is considering a number of proposed rate changes, which would lower fees for some riders while hiking them up for others. Nicole Brady is here with how this could affect you. Yeah, of course, this uh, would mostly impact regular bus riders, people who use it every day. But even if, even if you just ride the train to the plane occasionally, your cost could go up. Here's a look at the highest rate increase that RTD is considering. It would be $3 for local trips, an increase of 40 cents from the current rate, 50 cents uh, increase for regional trips, and a whopping $1.50 increase for the A line. That's the train to DIA. It's $9 right now. It would go up to $10.50 each way. These additional fees for some riders would help fund a discounted pass for lower income riders. A family earning $45,000 a year or less would qualify for a 40% discount. Now, RTD has held several public meetings on this increase all around the metro, and tonight again is the final one, your final chance. It's uh, tonight in Thornton at the Margaret Carpenter Rec Center from 6 to 8 p.m. And I want to point out here that under this proposal, monthly passes would also go up by $24. They're currently $99 a month. That is one of the most expensive monthly transit passes in the entire country. An increase would put us up higher than Chicago, just behind New York and Los Angeles. President Trump heads to America's heartland today. He's going to talk trade, his message after making a deal with the European Union just yesterday at the White House. Plus, Harley Davidson is having trouble attracting younger customers. I don't know if I would take one if it was given to me for free. How the company plans to attract younger riders when we come back. We're back with a check of things out at DIA if you're looking for a place to park. All the lots are wide open this morning. Uh, we know the bridge security gate says one minute. It's actually closed this morning. Other wait times up to 20 minutes at the north security gate. Today, President Trump heads to America's heartland to talk about trade. He's going to visit an Illinois steel town right near the Missouri border, which he often touts as an example of how his trade policies will help U.S. workers. The visit comes just a day after he and the president of the European Commission, you see there, made a deal to ease escalating trade tensions. We agreed today, first of all, to work together towards zero tariffs, zero non-tariff barriers, and zero subsidies on non-auto industrial goods. President Trump calls the agreement a, quote, very big deal for free and fair trade. One company highly critical of President Trump's tariffs is Harley-Davidson. But tariffs aren't the only thing hitting its bottom line. The company is also having trouble attracting new, younger customers. Industry analysts say millennials are buying fewer motorcycles than previous generations. So what's behind the change? Well, our sister station in Harley's home city of Milwaukee, Wisconsin, hit the streets to ask that very question. And they got some answers ranging from cost and lack of time to safety. They're very dangerous, and I'm not sure if I could support one physically. Harley-Davidson plans to launch a number of new products over the next 10 years to attract younger riders. They include electric motorcycles with a wider variety of prices. Facebook may need to add a dislike button for this next story. The company's stock plunged 20% after the markets closed yesterday. On news, its growth and user numbers fell short of expectations. CEO Mark Zuckerberg lost billions of dollars in just a couple of hours. But Facebook isn't the only company struggling with its user base and revenue. Netflix shares dropped earlier this month after the company missed revenue expectations. Today, Amazon releases its latest earnings report, which will not include sales numbers from its recent Prime Day sales. Toymaker Mattel plans to lay off more than 2,000 employees. The company says declining sales tied to the bankruptcy of Toys R Us is to blame for this. Following a terrible quarterly sales report, Mattel says it plans to cut 22% of its non-manufacturing workforce. Now, this comes just months after the company announced plans to close its New York office. Stock in Mattel fell 8% after that news was announced. Well, we've all seen those unique ways showing us how we can pull out our loose teeth. Yep, all over YouTube, right? Most of them <laughs> don't really work in the real world. But we have a new video this morning of one that did for a family in Austin, Texas. <laughs> yeah, take a look as this little girl's brother loads a dart with a string tied to her tooth into that Nerf gun he fires. And amazingly, it works. The girl's tooth comes flying right out of her mouth. Yeah, it turns out the this particular Nerf gun is more powerful than, than most. This one can shoot darts at up to 35 miles an hour. So that yanked the tooth out good. 
That seems a wee bit dangerous, a dart coming at you 35 miles an hour. Have you yeah. been in a recent Nerf gun fight? No. No. It hurts. No. Yeah. It hurts. And my kids love them. Yeah, they think it's funny <laughs> to take mom out, take her out. Jolene yeah. knocked out her last big tooth uh, with a baton, which because she was doing Ooh. the baton twirling, hit the ground, hit her tooth, and then knocked it out. It was oh. already loose, but. That's oh. one way to take That's care one way of it. to take it out. I need and a face hurt. mask. Yeah. Right. <laughs> We've got a, a few showers still lingering this morning. Most of it's now pushing across the southern edge of the metro area. So they're along C-470 and then stretching south. So the roads are going to be wet this morning. Damp to wet for the early morning drive. It will be in the low to mid 60s between about 7 and 8 o'clock. And then to right around 70 by 11. Pretty mild through midday, but more thunderstorms are on that emoji cast again this afternoon. And we'll likely start to see those pop up first in the mountains and foothills uh, by about 2 o'clock this afternoon. Now, with today's storms, there will be a less of a risk for some tornadoes, but we're still going to get some heavier rain, hail, and wind. Very similar to what we saw this past three days. Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday have all been uh, pretty active, and that crazy weather is going to stick with us through about Sunday. Good, pretty good chance for storms each afternoon. Now, it's a beautiful shot here from our Viero camera out in Akron. We're under a mostly sunny sky there. Skies are starting to clear from north to south, and we should see a, a beautiful sunrise with some of that cloud cover. Here's the view from City Park, and this was a lot darker just about 15 minutes ago. We had still some rain rolling through town, so things are now starting to dry up. It's 58 in Fort Collins, 60 right now in Denver, and 59 in Greeley. So this is actually one of the coolest mornings that we've seen all week long, some upper 50s to low 60s. Risk of severe weather today. It's going to be the areas the counties shaded there in the green. So like yesterday, you may be in one of those spots where it doesn't get uh, too intense this afternoon. But if you are under one of these stronger storms, we've got a risk of heavy rain, hail, and again, some of the stronger winds. We've seen gusts over about 50 to 70 miles per hour this past couple of days. Tomorrow's risk of severe weather once again covers parts of northeastern Colorado. It looks like we'll see fewer storms tomorrow, but there is still going to be a chance. Now, this is a similar scenario to what we saw on Tuesday when the overall picture was warmer and drier. But if you were under that one cell that rolled through the southern edge of the metro area, it wasn't too warm or dry. Uh, so that's, again, what could happen tomorrow with a few of the isolated storms. Near 80 today, upper 70s to near 80. Uh, on Friday, it's going to be a little warmer. We'll see some upper 80s near 90 Friday. Friday. And then storms likely again Saturday. Saturday and Sunday are going to be pretty busy in the afternoon. And we should see highs right around 80 to about 85 degrees uh, both days this weekend. Things start to heat up and dry out next week. Here's where the bigger change rolls in. Uh, Jace, by next Tuesday, there's that normal high in 90. And we'll be back in for a, another string of 90s by the middle of next week. And it is very wet. I just watched that rain go through Inglewood. I watched the rain go through parts of Centennial. And we also have this crash down here on C-470 right near Santa Fe, where we also had that rainstorm move through. And it's starting to get uh, the roads again in Highlands Ranch very wet. So just be mindful of that, especially at the higher speeds where we could have hydroplaning. It's really tough through the construction zone all the way in 470. That section has reopened. We'll go back over to I-25. We still have some very wet conditions. We still have the uh, eastbound side of Oxford closed down. So Union or Bellevue are, are good ways to get around it. And that minor crash at Santa Fe and Iowa this morning. Still seeing some of that outbound construction on uh, Pena Boulevard right past 56th Avenue. Just an extra maybe three or four minutes at least at this point. And wet roads up here to the north and definitely out to the west side of town. So just be mindful of that here this morning. Uh, difficult to get around this morning. Here's a look at what's coming up on Good Morning America right here at 7 a.m. In this morning's GMA First Look, watch this life-saving rescue as beachgoers in Emerald Isle, North Carolina, link arms, forming a human chain to save swimmers from deadly rip currents. The fire department says there were several rescues all in one day, but one man was pronounced dead, a 41-year-old who drowned after being torn away by a rip current. The caution at beaches all summer long. Do not ignore the red flag warnings. <laughs> Last year in Panama City, 80 strangers banded together to form this human chain nearly 100 yards into the Gulf of Mexico, saving the lives of 10 strangers who were swept out to sea by the vicious rip current. Without them, I wouldn't have my family. And so far this year, at least 24 people have been killed by rip currents, hundreds more rescued. And coming up at 7 a.m., we'll have tips on how to survive a rip current if you're caught in one. With your GMA First Look, I'm Candace Gibson, ABC News, New York. Pretty incredible video of all those people. Uh, people working together, together, yeah, to save people. Wow. Well, gentlemen, are you ready for love? <laughs> the Bachelor is coming to Denver, and they're looking for a few good men, maybe a few nutty ones. <laughs> Always a few there to lighten things up. We're going to let you know what you can expect if you head to today's casting call.
525, the Denver County Fairs come to an end, but there are a lot of fairs going on across Colorado this season. Check this out. The Arapahoe County Well County Fairs both started yesterday. They run through the weekend. The Douglas County Fair has events starting this weekend, including a parade on Saturday. Adams County Fair starts next Wednesday. The Larimer County and Boulder County Fairs, these, those both start uh, August 3rd. And Jefferson County, that fair is about to start about oh, two weeks away. And then the big Colorado State Fair, that's the one in Pueblo. It kicks off August 24th. Larry the Cable Boy, the Oak Ridge Boys, and Old Dominion will be there performing. Happening today in Denver, producers from ABC's The Bachelor are looking for men looking for love. They're holding a casting call for the next season of the show. If you go, expect to spill all the dirt on your love life, including your perfect date, relationship goals, and what you're looking for in an ideal partner. The casting calls run from 4 to 8 tonight at the Blue Moon Rhino Brewery in Denver. But you may want to get there a little early. Producers are expecting up to 500 people to and, show up. Yeah, it'll be the most dramatic rose ceremony. No, that's never mind. <laughs> Also, a quick reminder to keep your Friday plans open for us because we're going to be out partying at Northfield Stapleton. We're going to be celebrating Colorado's 142nd birthday. Yeah, come say hi. We'll have lots of activities for the kids and uh, live music from our own Shannon Ogden. It's all free. It goes from 2 to 8 Friday afternoon. We promise Lisa will not get up and sing with Shannon. Yes, that's well, the, we're that's try the deal. To stop her. Yeah. Families are trying to get back on their feet following that massive apartment fire in Westminster. And this morning, we have details on how you can help them out. Plus, Denver, get ready. Those dockless scooters, they're making a comeback to the city. What you need to know before they hit the sidewalks. Right now on Denver 7 News at 530, are you sick of the soggy skies yet? We're already seeing rain in the metro this morning, and the worst may still be on the horizon. Yeah, more to come. Well, we were complaining about how hot and dry it was, right? So now we're finally getting some much-needed uh, rain and moisture. Uh, we do have a risk of severe storms, though, again today. We'll talk about this, plus I'll show you where the rain is falling right now for the morning commute coming up. And new this morning, pilots are taking Frontier Airlines to court. What that lawsuit means for their ongoing contract negotiations. Welcome back to Denver 7 News at 5.30 on this Thursday morning. I'm Molly Hendricks. Yeah, it's Friday Eve now, and I'm Mitch Jelnick. We've already seen a wet start to the morning. We had lots of rain as we were coming in today. Probably not going to dry out a whole lot today. We've issued a first alert action day for storms rolling into the metro again this afternoon. Let's give you a live look from our Mile High camera this morning. You can see uh, some still some clouds there, a little cloud cover. There's even a bit of a uh, sunrise behind those clouds, but that's going to change later today. The sun tends to rise this time in the morning. Yes. Here's number seven mural. Just leave it all. Same direction. <laughs> <laughs> Your first alert for when we can see those thunderstorms. It's amazing how that works. Makes it easier, right? Uh, uh, we've got this morning early, uh, low 60s early on. Between about 6 and 7 o'clock, we're going to see some, it looks like low 60s. Getting uh, to near 70 by 10. Now, some of the cloud cover that we saw this morning, that's going to clear up. You'll start to see some sunshine, a little mix of sun and clouds through midday. 75 at noon and then about 80 for a high at 4 o'clock. Then the storms hit. Again, between about 2 and 4, we're going to see some wet roads here in town. And speaking of wet roads, you shot there on that live camera. We have some right now here in town. Here's the view from City Park. Showers rolling through Denver within the last 30 to 45 minutes. Uh, we had one round at about 3 a.m. That one is down now near the Springs. And then the round that just moved through, that's pushing across the southern edge of the metro area. So you're getting rain right now. They're along C-470 from Roxboro east toward Castle Pines. And it's going to hit Castle Rock here in the next 10 to 15 minutes. So expect some wet roads. Now, coming up in just a few minutes, we'll take a look at the storms that are going to, again, redevelop the afternoon and what we could see from today's crazy weather. Back to you guys. Well, the recent rain we've been seeing here in Colorado is helping fire crews battling fires across the state. A number of counties have lowered their fire restrictions because of the moisture. While fire and climatology experts say moisture across the southwest has slowed the growth of fires, we're not out of the woods yet. A number of wildfires are still not fully contained. Well, developing this morning in Inglewood, neighbors want answers after the death of a woman in a flooded basement. This is 32-year-old Rachel Haber died at the hospital after being pulled from the water unresponsive. This was Tuesday evening. Neighbors are upset by her death, but they're also angry at the city. They claim the drainage system filled up and no one came out to clear it. Now, we spoke with one neighbor who says it's been an ongoing issue on Tacoma Street for years. The fact that this isn't properly drained well and the city... I don't know if the city's doing everything that they can, but I mean, the fact that that happened in 20 minutes and she couldn't get out, that's scary. That's, it's not okay. 
The city of Inglewood declined to give a statement about the neighbor's concerns, but it did give us a statement calling Tuesday's weather event a 100-year storm. And water from that storm caused this sinkhole on nearby Oxford Avenue in Sheridan, which swallowed an SUV. This morning, engineers plan to go into a six-foot diameter pipe to see just how damaged things are down there. The owner of the SUV was told to get out of her car by a good Samaritan, and this morning she's still trying to track down her guardian angel. And now let's head over to Jason for a check of traffic. Jason, how long will this sinkhole be an issue and how can people get around it? It could be an issue until next week. That is a large hole. There's a lot of damage there on Oxford, just on the west side of Santa Fe. And so it's going to be closed down, at least the eastbound side for some time. The westbound side is open going over to Federal, but coming from Federal over here to Santa Fe is the one that's closed down. So Union, just south of there, Bellevue is also a good way to get around it or Hamden 285 just to the north can easily get you around that sinkhole problem as they're going to fix it, but it could be next week week until it's all better. We do have a huge area of standing water that was in that construction zone on the eastbound side of C470 right here between Santa Fe and Lucent. Driver hit it, flipped over on its side. Left lane is blocked right now on that eastbound side, so traffic is a little slow trying to get over to Lucent, but it just shows you that there are some areas of standing water. This was the latest picture I could get from the CDOT camera over there, and you could see some of the slower traffic heading over towards Lucent. The rest of the drive doesn't look too bad with some uh, rollover crash cleanup still going on on I-70 by looking out mountain. Soggy morning out there. Thanks, Jason. New this morning, we're breaking down a lawsuit against Frontier Airlines. The Airline Pilots Association is suing, not only demanding better pay for the pilots, but the union also accuses Frontier of undermining contract negotiations for the past two years. And Nicole Brady is in the newsroom with that lawsuit and what it means for the ongoing negotiations. Well, it means that the heat is uh, turning up here, the union turning up the pressure against Frontier. This lawsuit, almost 50 pages long, it lists multiple examples of how the union claims Frontier has mistreated its pilots, including canceling 140 pilots summer vacations, threatening to punish pilots if they failed to fly more hours, altering sick days and changing the commuting rules. The Airline Pilots Association says Frontier pilots are already the lowest paid major airline pilots in North America, earning around 40% less than their peers. The lawsuit filed yesterday in U.S. District Court demands pay increases and also asks the judge to require Frontier to stop undermining the bargaining process. That's another accusation by the union. Frontier sent us a response to this, saying in part that they're disappointed the union is spending energy on false narratives rather than attempting to reach a fair agreement. So this lawsuit is actually separate from the union's ongoing effort with the National Media board to negotiate a new contract for the pilots. Those negotiations are currently at an impasse and that could lead to a pilot strike in the near future. We'll continue to bring you any new developments with the lawsuit or those negotiations. Molly. All right, Nicole, thank you. Also new this morning, the coroner has identified the two people who were killed in that massive apartment fire in Westminster. The coroner says 41-year-old Leah Hamill of Florida and 58-year-old Margaret Kelly of Westminster both died of fire-related injuries early Sunday morning. We also got an update on those injured. Five people are still in the hospital. Three of them are in critical condition. So far, investigators don't know what caused that fire. If you'd like to help the dozens of families displaced from this fire, uh, you can do so starting today. A donation center opens up in just a few hours at 8 this morning at the Rodeo Market on West 73rd Avenue in Westminster. They need donations like personal hygiene items, new clothing, bedding, linens, non-perishable food items, even grocery gift cards to help those families get back on their feet. The donation center will remain open through August 19th. 537 now. New this morning, a new report from Colorado's Leeds School of Business uh, has some good news for our state's economy. Business is booming, according to the school. The report finds nearly 123,000 new business filings have been submitted over the last year. And renewals of existing filings are up more than 7% over last year. In fact, in the second quarter of the year, 689,000 businesses were in good standing, a record high for our state. New this morning, Broomfield-based Noodles & Company is planning a public stock sale. The company plans to make 2.5 million shares of common stock available for purchase. And then shareholders will add another 6 million shares to that sale. Soon, instead of your boring morning commute, you're going to be able to take an electric scooter or dockless bicycle. Denver Public Works just signed off on a pilot program to allow several companies to bring these rides back onto city streets. And Denver 7's Megan Lopez is live this morning. Megan, there are a bunch of rules that now come with this. 
I know, Molly, kind of dampering your fun, right? But you're not going to be allowed to ride the scooters on the streets with cars. You're not going to be able to ride them in protected bike lanes like this. You're only going to be able to ride them on sidewalks. And so that means that pedestrians might have to watch out, guys, because I've seen them and they go pretty fast. And so this is why we're talking about uh, the pedestrians needing to watch out. This is video from San Antonio, Texas, earlier this month, where a woman was hit by one of these electric scooters as she was leaving work. The woman was injured, the rider took off, and it caused some people there to question if these scooters are actually safe on sidewalks. After pulling dockless scooters from Denver last month, the Public Works Department says that it's come up with a permitting plan for them and also for dockless bicycles. And it's approved the permits for five scooter companies and for three bicycle companies on a test basis. So you'll start seeing those scooters back in Denver as soon as tomorrow and the bicycles back here as soon as next month. And again, there are going to be a bunch of rules associated with them, including where you can ride them, how you can ride them, and also where you can park them. And it's really going to be determined, this pilot program, on how people use them for whether or not these things are going be able to stay in our city in the future. I'm live in Denver. Megan Lopez, Denver 7. We'll do this morning. We're just days away from the groundbreaking for the Central 70 project. And this week, we've already looked at how they're replacing the viaduct and other bridges. Now, Jason's been doing many stories on this over the last week or so. Before we get to the big project, uh, some other places are not doing any stories on this. We wanted to get you ready because it's going to be huge. Today, we're talking about this underground portion, mm -hmm. this new one. And it's going to be bright like the forum shops at Caesars Palace. Yeah. Oh, it'll be like daytime <laughs> inside. Yeah, that's right. Years ago, the old Stapleton Airport, remember at I-70 near Quebec, there are these several wide bridges that the passenger jets used to use right. as a taxiway, right? Used to go right over the interstate. Well, those tunnels, they used to cause these phantom traffic jams every single day. And that was one of the reasons because the tunnels were so dark during even a bright day. Now, CDOT says the new Central I-70 underground tunnel will be filled with light very similar to the twin tunnels tunnels there on I-70 near Idaho Springs. Think about the twin tunnels that now it's called the Veterans Memorial Tunnels up in the mountains of what that tunnel like was like before CDOT rebuilt it and what it's like now because there is a very human um, you know reaction to start breaking when you see darkness. Now the tunnels will also be very colorful as well as the entire project. The walls along the central I-70 project will include blues and reds because they say, CDOT does, this is a very colorful part of town, different than the beiges and tans that you see along I-25 to the <laughs> south where the T-Rex project was built. I think people were breaking too because they were watching the planes go over. Yeah. That too. Back when Stapleton it was, was fascinating around. to watch. Yeah, it was cool. All right, hopefully we've learned something. Thanks, Jace. <laughs> Well, today, Larimer Square in downtown Denver celebrates 47 years since it became the city's first historic district. But today's celebration comes with a protest from those who don't want to see the area changed by any new development. Protesters will be in Larimer Square handing out T-shirts and stickers this afternoon. The group is opposed to plans to build a pair of new towers there in Larimer Square. Right now, those plans are on hold. Well, the new wave of youth activism is trying to lower the voting age. Up next, we're going 360 to look at the arguments for and against this move. Plus, Colorado isn't the only part of America that's seen severe weather this week. We have a look at the damage across the U.S. It's 541. It's now quarter to six and we're back with breaking news out of Arizona. Officers have just finished a procession for an officer who was shot and killed just west of Phoenix early this morning. That trooper had just completed training and graduated from the academy two months ago. Another trooper was wounded and is in the hospital right now. At 16, you get a driver's license. It's a rite of passage, but then you have to wait to legally smoke, drink, or vote. Now there's a push to lower the voting age to 16. So Denver 7 is taking a 360 look at this issue to bring you multiple viewpoints. Supporters say if high school students can organize a worldwide march on the issue uh, as controversial as gun control, well, they're more than capable of voting. But critics say since most teenagers don't pay taxes, they shouldn't be voting on how to spend other people's money. We're going to put out warnings not to eat Tide Pods, but we're also going to let them vote. I think at 16, from a cognitive development standpoint, kids have absolutely developed the cognitive ability to consider abstract concepts. 
Right now, 20 countries have granted 16-year-olds the right to vote, while a handful of American cities allow them to vote in certain elections. This is creating a lot of buzz online, and we've been reading your thoughts and your comments. Susie says, no, honestly, I think it should be 25 when the brain has fully developed, and most decisions are made with more maturity. While Dylan says, quote, this is perfectly reasonable. They have to deal with our choices and consequences, so why shouldn't they have a say? Well, what do you think about the voting age? Should it be changed? We know there are lots of opinions on this. We'd love to hear your thoughts. You can email us at 360 at thedenverchannel.com or reach out to us on Facebook or Twitter. Developing this morning, Milwaukee police are mourning one of their own killed in a shootout. Officers were looking for a man wanted on gun and drug violations. They say when they got near him, he started shooting, hitting the officer. I'm sad to inform you that the officer that was injured did not make it today. Um, and it's a difficult time for the police department. He's a 17-year veteran who is well-loved by the department and a friend of mine. Police arrested the suspect. This is the second Milwaukee police officer to die in the line of duty in nearly two months. Indianapolis thinks it has a way to stop violent crime throughout the city. The city has 